senseless violence generated by the frightening plague of drugs and guns in our society. People have to start, you know, coming together to, to fight this, and so it'll be, I mean, there'll be no more violence around. I mean, I can't, I can't stand it. As long as these officers and something peppers out here, they're going to respond out here. Let me tell you that. I understand. Okay? I'm glad they do respond. For your respond. safety, my safety, and everybody else's safety. Do this is the scene on the streets of Boston, a city under fire. Tonight, the city of Boston, the hub of culture and commerce in New England, is truly a city under fire. The cruel reality of gangs, guns, and drugs has hit home with a shocking regularity in recent months. The violence threatens to tear apart the fabric of our communities. It affects all of us in some way. In the following 30 minutes tonight, we'll take a look at the community through the eyes of a family who has lost a loved one to the violence. We'll examine the emotional toll the violence exacts on all of us and on the city. And we'll talk live with a community activist and with Mayor Ray Flynn about the frustrating job of fighting an elusive enemy. And we'll spend a night with those who face that frustration daily, the police officers. Eyewitness Newsman Dan Ray reports the trail of violence is a constant reminder of the difficult job ahead. It has become a staple of the Boston night, a sudden, unexplained eruption of urban violence. Although the victims have names, they remain anonymous. But every once in a while, a murder of the most innocent inflames our passion and fuels our collective outrage. Last summer, the slaughter of 12-year-old Tiffany Moore galvanized Boston. Cut down in a gang crossfire, Tiffany Moore, at 12, became an unwitting victim of drugs, thugs, and Boston's turf warfare. Throughout this summer of 1989, police and city officials took the offensive with an aggressive campaign against Boston's gangs. For three hot summer months, the streets stayed unseasonably cool. But all that changed as summer turned to fall. Since September 1st, 14 murders in Boston, eight of those victims dead by gunshot. In all, 101 gunshot victims in September and October. The two most prominent victims, Charles and Carol Stewart. The Redding couple ravaged Monday night by a lone gunman as they left a birthing class at Brigham and Women's Hospital. The vicious murder of Carol Stewart and the shooting of her husband set off one of the most intense police manhunts in the city's history. But as police scour every inch of Mission Hill seeking Monday's murderer, in another part of Area B, it is business as usual for detectives Mark Vickers and Gus Irby. Vickers and Irby are the grunts, the infantry, the unsung heroes, as Boston loses its war against drugs. These kids are walking around with the mentality of, 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 of someone who has, who, who has a, terminal, a terminal disease, who's dying of cancer and knows they only have six months a year to live. And these kids are treating their life like that. That's why they will take you down in a heartbeat. This is the police work you usually don't see on television. No arrest here, one pocket knife off the street. It says 007 right there on it. See, 007. Come on, man. I was looking at See you later. Have a nice evening, young man. Even in a losing war, there can still be minor victories. It's the parents' duties to discipline and raise their children. If not, the criminal job easier. And if not, the criminal justice system will, 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 they will have to be dealt with, with by the criminal justice system. Let's face Mark it. Vickers and Gus no, Irby are Boston cops, cops who choose to I live in the heart of this city, a city whose very arteries are coated with layers of cocaine, crack, heroin, drug dealers, drug runners, money launderers, and fast suspects in sneakers. Suspects who, when chased, fly like the wind. This time, the bad guy got away, but not after a good run for his money from Mark Vickers. I saw the gun in his pants, so I, he definitely has a gun. Frustration is the silent partner of all Boston detectives, especially the good ones. The dealers are tough to catch, the defense lawyer is tough to beat, and often the judges and politicians, tough to figure. You'll have the politicians come out here and they'll thump in and they'll, yeah, oh yeah, this is unconstitutional. I say, hey, those old people and those decent people in this town have a, have, a, have a right to live in safety. They have rights too. 
You know, I don't want to come down to a comparison or, 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 or to a choice of their constitutional rights or the constitutional rights of decent citizens. Don't ask me to make that that judgment there. Put themselves in, when they're when they're thinking of what should Empathize, be doing. This, in other words, what, put themselves in the opposition now. If I have to go out there now, who would I arrest and who wouldn't? You know, what, and put and themselves why? in the opposition. That's all I ask. My girlfriend Stacy, her friend just walked right around the corner. But she don't live in this house. Right there, just says Stacy. Don't live in that house. I know. I'm, I'm chilling. I'm talking to. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying. Go get. Go get. I have no drugs, man. Get in the car. I want you to get in the car. I want you to get in the car. And I want you to drive on about your business. It's not a racial incident. We are faced with a clear and present danger. And it's here and it's now. And we're dealing with it here and now. The Boston Police Department is dealing with it right now and right here. Let me tell you this. As long as these officers and something campers out here, they're going to respond out here. Let me tell you that. What about our constitutional rights? You know, what about our right to live in, 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 in safety without fear? You know, because, because the politicians are out there saying, oh, don't stop that gang, don't stop that group. You know, I'm sure they would have something to say about if we stopped that group while the kids right out there. If I would have stopped them early, I probably would have had the gun now. When I first saw them, I would have had the gun now. One less gun off the street, one gunslinger off the street. I'm live here in Area B in Roxbury, and just for a little bit of perspective, Area B is one of the Boston Police Districts, about a mile and a half square, 65,000 residents, and at any given time, about 40 police officers. In the last 24-hour period, there have been 12 drug arrests in this area alone. Eight people have been arrested on warrants. One of those warrants was for rape, another was for assault with a gun. In addition, there was one arrest today in Area B for unarmed robbery. Last night, incidentally, in this area, in this small little section of Boston, in Mattapan, a sawed-off shotgun fully loaded was seized, and in Grove Hall, a part of Roxbury, a 9mm gun fully loaded was seized. Just another average day as the war on drugs here continues in Area B. This is Dan Ray live in Area B. Back to you, Jack and Liz. What an uphill battle. Dan, it sounds almost hopeless. Do these two officers that you spoke with in this report, who are extraordinary men, do they see any reason for hope, any optimism? I think their continued presence here in the community would probably best and most articulately speak to their optimism. But when I asked them what it will be like five years from now if things continue as they are going, they said it will get worse before it gets better. Pretty scary. Dan, thanks for the live report. Perhaps those most conscious of the problems and most burdened by their effects are the people living in the communities torn by the violence. Tonight, Eyewitness News reporter Sarah Ann Shaw talks with one family who lost a loved one to that violence. Some people um, won't visit us. When they do visit us, they feel they have to get out of here before dark, and it really makes you feel bad. This woman and her family are caught in the pressures created by the crossfire of the community. There was a time when we would look out the window to see what's going on, but not anymore. I'm afraid to even go to the window to look. Because if they're shooting, you don't know if the bullets are going to come through the window. The other day, Chevelle said she heard a shot, and she told Trevor to hit the floor because she thought it was right outside the window. This family lost a son in the violence. He was killed on his mother's birthday, August 25th, in a car in Dorchester. Police say 17-year-old Rigoberto Godfrey was a leader of one of the gangs in Boston. Investigators say another man may have been killed in retaliation for Godfrey's murder. The police don't give us that 100% as long as it's have anything to do with gang. We get, we get the less. For instance, look at what happened to this lady, you know, which is very bad for the guy to kill this lady, this pregnant lady and stuff like that. They put so much effort in this thing. When Rigo got killed, nobody's, the, the, what, what are they doing? Nobody, we don't even know if they're trying to find out who killed Rigo. I wonder what do they think of us? Um, do they think that we're all bad, that we're, they, anybody that's considered bad in this community, they always look at them as people who are on welfare, who um, don't like to work, who drink a lot, and we're not like that. We don't use drugs, we don't drink. I'm a member of the Chancel Choir at the um, Ebenezer Baptist Church. The, my two young boys go to Sunday school every Sunday, so we're, we're not like that. The family lives in Dorchester on a busy section of American Legion Highway. Last night, they talked about their life in Boston and how people outside the city see them. 
As long as you come from Dorchester, Mattapan, or Roxbury, you're automatically a bad person. They label you. They say they look at us like um, we're nothing. They stereotype everyone to be criminals or gang members or killers or whatever. They don't take the time to um, get to know, you know, people in the community. They just stereotype. And if they took the time, what would they find? They would find a lot of people just like themselves, successful people, working people, family-oriented people, and happy people. Stacy Lawrence, who's expecting Rico's child, spends a lot of time with his family. She says she's happy the baby is coming, but is still frightened. At first I was scared, because I know my baby didn't have a father or anything, but now I'm not scared anymore. You think it's going to be safer for your child living? No. Why? I don't think it's never going to be safe out here. Why? Because it's not. But Rigo's mother is more hopeful. I could talk to my mother this morning and she said to me, you know, I'm beginning to believe when people used to say the world is coming to an end, she said, I think it really is. I said, well, I don't know about that. I believe if you just have faith and trust in God and believe in God, I believe eventually things will change for the better. I really do. They certainly can't get any worse. The family says if the son they lost, Godfrey, was involved in gang or drug activity, they had no indication at home. They say he was respectful and helpful. The violence is bringing calls for action from many community leaders throughout the area. Joining us live now from Roxbury is one of those activists. He's the Reverend Graylin Hagler from the Church of the United Community. Reverend, you've heard various descriptions of what's going on in the community, including that last one. There are good people who live there, but is Roxbury now being controlled by gangs and drug dealers? No, I, I wouldn't say that Roxbury is being controlled by uh, gangs and, and drug dealers. Uh, obviously, there is an issue that is going on. Uh, I think that, uh, that we need to have some type of creative approach to the issues that we are involved in our community. What we're facing in our community is just what every other community is facing. Uh, uh, we end up on the front page. I mean, that's the, that's the irony of what's going on. What do you think is the first thing that needs to be done differently to help the problem in your community, or do we just continue doing what we're doing now? Well, I think what we're doing now is, is, is wrong. Uh, it's, it's too forceful. I mean, obviously, we've been carrying on macho police tactics for decades. That has not worked. The situation has gotten worse. The jails have gotten full. Uh, there are more people in, in situations of desperation. Obviously, we need to change those tactics. Uh, possibly at this point, we need to look at uh, clearly the police department involving themselves in some type of educational process, educating uh, uh, before they uh, uh, end up with a gun on their side to enter into classrooms and to, and to enter into rec centers to maybe, instead of getting a gun, uh, to end up with hockey skates and other things like that, to be involved intricately in the lives of youth and in, and in the lives of the community. I think that the police will see the community differently. The youth in the community will see the police differently. Reverend, you know, that's fine to look long run, uh, yes. But how about now? I mean, right now we're seeing a proliferation of youth with guns carrying them on the streets. You have residents who are scared. And they also would counter that the reason why there are so many headlines about that community is the number of deaths and the number of murders there far outnumbers any other community in the Commonwealth. But, but let's face reality. I mean, the police do not really know where the guns are, where the drugs are. The youth in the community, they know where the guns are, where the drugs are, who are causing trouble. The fact is, is that there is a, a lack of relationship with those young people. And, and we need to start prevention along with crime stopping. Uh, we cannot have one without the other. It will be ineffective. The jail cells will fill up, and uh, we will get nowhere. Okay, Reverend Graylin Hagler from the Church of the United Community, thank you for joining us thank tonight. Thank you very much. Coming up next, the emotional toll, the rash of violence is taking on our residents, our communities, and on our city. What's it doing to us? Andy Hiller explores that question when this Eyewitness News special report continues.
The toll from the violence now plaguing our city cannot be counted only in dead and wounded. There's also a toll in terms of fear and frustration and the image of our city. Eyewitness newsman Andy Hiller says the Stewart shooting story is one that leaves few people unaffected. What is it about these pictures and this story that make us hurt so much? It can't simply be that they are violent because violent crime has become almost routine in Boston, regularly reported. Tonight, violence in Dorchester. Police say that a teenage boy was killed. They found him lying next to his bicycle with a gunshot wound to the head. Eyewitness News reporter Hampton Pearson joins us live now from Dorchester with the latest on this story. Hampton? Police say 24-year-old Derek Horcho was found lying on the sidewalk outside 93 Bowden Avenue at noontime. He'd been shot five times in the face and chest. Police say they're looking for any clues. Tonight, a Mattapan shooting spree has now left three people wounded. Boston police are looking for three suspects tonight. But the Stewart story is different. I think because of the heinousness of it. A uh, pregnant woman, uh, it's just, it's just uh, beyond belief to me. I got a lump in my throat and tears roll up in my eyes because I think it's awful. It just really hits home. It's something that can happen to you any time. It could happen here as we go to our car in the parking lot, and I think it causes terror. In Wellesley, the Stewart story triggers fear. Last month, Wellesley united against racist and anti-Semitic graffiti found in the town. But now suburbia has been touched by an urban crime it can't ignore. Where is the protection? We never know who's going to do something to us. Have you always felt that way? No. No. In a town restaurant, economic class is also an issue. When you have something that you treasure and you're, you're a constructive uh, couple or person, uh, there's always the threat of it being destroyed by people that are less fortunate or just don't have the same kind of values and you know, mentality that you have. A couple from Milton says the war on crime must be escalated. If it's not, I, we're doomed to live with this until things get worse and worse and worse and we kill each other off. And it puts the rest of us in, on the defensive and uh, looking around our shoulder every five minutes for fear of someone coming behind us and, and doing something to us. Tenants in these public housing apartments in Mattapan always worry about what's going to happen. Talk to a group and they'll tell you there are break-ins, muggings, and there's not enough security. These citizens believe they've seen the fabric of society tear. I think it didn't change because I don't know why they obey the laws now. I really think it didn't change. Everything is violence and shooting and killing. In this area here, we have a killing every day, and we wonder when it's going to be our turn. That apprehension is shared near the scene where the Stuarts were shot, where world-class hospitals sit on streets that make medical staffers feel at personal risk. If you're living in the city and you, you have to travel in the city, you should be able to do that without fear or apprehension that you're going to be shot, murdered, or you know, stabbed. Is that how you feel? Yes, that is how I feel. And I, I think that more police protection on the streets is something that has to be looked at very carefully. A hospital driver has chilling advice for people headed to the area. I tell them not to walk too here alone. At any time. Well, during the day it ain't that bad because there's a lot of people around here. But at night, like after like 6 o'clock, no way, I wouldn't do it. Another hospital worker tackles a volatile aspect of the Stewart story, race. I think um, a lot of people are looking at it at that point, like it is a racial, a racial thing. I mean that, you know, the guy, blacks are the ones doing most of the shooting, most of the killing and all this. But uh, this instance, I, I, I just think it wasn't uh, racially motivated at all because most of the killing that blacks are doing is blacks against blacks. What do you think caused this one? money. For my hour and 15 minutes, my hour and a half commute each day, it's more than worth it to me to have the serenity and the peace that I feel I have in New Hampshire. Jim Ward knows Boston well enough to know he wants his family to live elsewhere. He works in Kenmore Square and thinks crime can no longer be contained in Boston's so-called high crime areas. It's tremendously terrible that it happened to that couple but the potential is there for that to explode, my feeling is, at any time in areas that, that normal people, that the everyday common working person is, and we will be exposed to that type of violence.
His wife dismisses any links between the Stewart shooting and racism. The people that say that are going to say that no matter what. That's what they want to see, that that's what they're looking to make that issue. I don't think it's an issue of race. I think it's an issue of crime. And in Faneuil Hall, one of Boston's major tourist attractions, it's clear the Stewart crime has hurt the city's reputation. It is surprising for Boston, to be honest with you. It is, it is rather surprising for Boston, I think so. It did kind of shock me. It makes me a little more concerned about going outside in Boston, but um, I'm not surprised. We are, it is a city, so you expect this kind of stuff to happen. Expect it to happen, and it will. And every day you and your family and your friends are not victims of crime. The odds will increase you will be. We feel vulnerable because we are vulnerable. So many of us can see ourselves in the Stewart's car. Jack and Liz. All right, Andy. Thank you. Next, how to deal with the violence? What should we be doing to stop it? We'll be talking live with Mayor Ray Flynn when this Eyewitness News special report continues. Boston's problems with violence are not unique, and neither are the calls for city officials to take action. Joining us live now is Boston Mayor Ray Flynn, who is no doubt feeling both sides of the issue, both with the pain inflicted by this violence and also the political pressure. Mayor, you've heard these reports tonight. It is a very tangible fear within the Roxbury community and the suburbanites, all talking about crime in Boston. What do you tell people? Well, I think it's uh, very important to put it in focus here. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, this uh, recent tragedy certainly has captured a significant amount of attention, not only here in Boston, but across the country, uh, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, I would add, however, that uh, any incident of, uh, of violence uh, committed against any innocent person is, uh, should be met with the same level of outrage. Uh, it is also very important to put into focus the fact that if you compare Boston's homicide rate with that of many major cities in the country, you'll find that Boston's homicide rate is much lower uh, than many of those cities, even cities of uh, smaller population than the city of Boston. So while we have uh, problems like every city in this country have, uh, it's, uh, Boston, in fact, is, uh, is not in the league with uh, many of the cities in, in terms of homicide. Well, we have to put this in its proper perspective, and we appreciate that. In the meantime, you've said you need more money to fight this problem. Suppose you don't get more money. Suppose there are no new taxes the way you want them for the city of Boston. What are you going to do then, Mayor? Liz, I thought it was a, an, an excellent discussion uh, Dean Ray had with those two detectives out there in the neighborhoods of the city. I think it kind of indicates the job that they are doing in a courageous way and putting their self, themselves on the line each and every night. Um, you know, to have those kind of people out there is really important and really uh, significant. And that's what I would like to do, put more uh, committed police officers out in the neighborhoods of the city of Boston uh, on a regular basis. Uh, also dealing with uh, other issues that are the root causes of violence, uh, drugs and guns. Those are the uh, two major issues that uh, we're seeing a significant increase in violence, not only in Boston, all across this country. And it takes resources. Uh, people ask me all the time, what happened this summer? You had a remarkably uh, safe summer in Boston. What happened? How is it that uh, things changed? Well, put it this way. What we did in Boston this summer, we made commitment for a job for every kid. We fixed up our parks and playgrounds, recreational, uh, educational programs that all cost money, a significant amount of resources. I like to be able to do that on an ongoing basis, but you can't spend money you don't have. And I, I just ask uh, people up at the State House uh, to understand that. Give us the kind of uh, tools to do the job that we need to do in order to make uh, Boston the world class city that we want it to be. But you know, these are tough economic times. The chances of you getting more money may be slim, some people would say, even if that becomes a reality. Well, yeah. you don't get any increases. Are you still going to increase the number of police officers in Boston? Jack, you, I always make the point that you either pay now or you pay later. Um, you know, people were talking about more prisons and, and uh, more police officers and more jails. And, you know, there's an argument that can be made for that. But also, uh, if you really want to reach a lot of these people, 
a lot of uh, young people in our neighborhoods, and it's all across the city. It's not any one or two particular areas. It's all across the city. You have to really reach them before they get involved in, in gangs and guns and, and violence and drugs. Uh, you do that through education. You do that through job training, giving people. Uh, you replace the despair. You replace the drugs with hope and opportunity. And you, you, you fight it from a public safety point of view, yes. There's no question about that. But you also have to get to the root causes of, uh, of drugs and, and, and violence. And that is uh, hope and opportunity, jobs and education particularly. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Tough uh, challenges ahead. Thank sure. you. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. That's our Eyewitness News special report for tonight. The issues we examine tonight are ongoing, and the problems are not easily solved. It's an area I guarantee we'll be following very closely in the days and months to come. Until then, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight.